Now that we've begun our discussion on work and energy, we're going to take a look at another type of energy referred to as potential energy, and then we'll look at the principle of conservation of energy as well. So potential energy is related to work. We really want to stress the word change. So it's a change in potential energy is equal to the negative of the work done. So the whole point here now that's important is that potential energy is always going to involve some sort of a change. Now we're going to talk about a value of potential energy and the way we do that is by setting up a position where the potential energy is equal to zero. So we as the problem solvers set that up. Where do we want the potential energy to be equal to zero? Now whereas there are no wrong choices as to where the potential energy is equal to zero, some choices are easier than others or more sensible than others. And a word often associated with where the potential energy is equal to zero is the datum. So let's start off by looking at one of the easier potential energies and that's the potential energy due to gravity. Now remember that work is equal to the integral of the force dotted with the displacement where force is a vector and displacement is a vector. And when we talk about work, we're going to talk about the work in moving from position 1 to position 2. And that's going to equal this integral and I'm going to integrate from position 1 to position 2. Now when we're talking about gravity, the force due to gravity, which is also referred to as weight recall, is equal to mg and it's in the j hat direction and it's down, so negative mg times j hat. And so the work done by gravity, which I'll label with a s subscript of small g, is equal to the integral from some position r1 to another position r2 of m g j hat dotted with the displacement dr. And I need to remember the minus sign here. Now the mass does not change as I move from point 1 to point 2, and the acceleration due to gravity does not change as I move from point 1 to point 2. So minus mg comes out, and I'm going to be left with j hat dotted with dr, still integrating from r1 to r2. But dr would be some random displacement, and it's going to have an x component, which I might call dx, and a y component, which I might call dy. And this would be in the j hat direction, and dx is in the i hat direction. And so I get minus mg the integral of j hat dotted with dx i hat plus dy j hat. Again, I'm going from r1 to r2. But when we do a dot product, j dotted with i is 0, and j dotted with j is 1. So this becomes minus mg times the integral of dy and so there's no sense in integrating from r1 to r2, I'm just going to integrate from y1 to y2. And what that means is it doesn't matter what my displacement in the x direction is, all that matters is my y displacement. And so this is minus mg y2 minus y1. Well, keep in mind now that the potential energy, more importantly the change in potential energy, is negative the work. So if I use the letter U for potential energy and I'll subscript that with a G for gravitational potential energy, that's going to equal mg times y2 minus y1. And so if y1 is down here and y2 is up here, then as I move from a lower position to an upper position, y2 is greater than y1, so this is going to be a positive value and so my p potential energy will have changed, it will have increased in moving from a lower position y1 to a higher position y2. And the amount of that potential energy will be proportional to the change in the height or equal to the change in the height times mg. Now very often you're going to see the gravitational potential energy written as mgh where h is some distance above the datum. Now very, very often the datum is the ground level. So an object will have a gravitational potential energy equal to its weight times its height. And that assumes that the zero point for potential energy is the ground. And we'll see examples where that's not the best way of doing that. But in general it works out just fine. So if I'm talking about a rock and I'm on top of a tower, so here's the ground level, and 
here's the tower and I'm standing up here on top of the tower and I drop the rock from up here and it's going to fall. Then I would say that up here at the top the gravitational potential energy is equal to mg times h where h is this height above the ground and when the rock gets to about here half the height of the tower then the gravitational potential energy is equal to mg times the new height but the new height is h over 2 and then just before the rock hits the ground it's at a height of 0 and so the gravitational potential energy at that point is 0. So the gravitational potential energy at the top is twice the gravitational potential energy that it had at the middle and then at the ground level there is no longer any potential energy. Now if I think about change in potential energy even if somebody said hey let's make y equal to 0 up here at the top when I go from the top to the bottom when I drop that rock the change in potential energy so I'll call that delta u sub g the change in potential energy would be the final potential energy which is 0 minus the initial potential energy which is minus mgh and so the change in potential energy is negative mgh but if somebody said let's make y equal to 0 at the top then the gravitational potential energy up here is equal to zero. That's my new datum. When I get to the bottom, y is equal to minus h. Keep in mind now, y is positive in the upward direction. So my new position down here is negative h. And so the potential energy down here then would be equal to minus mgh. Or if you prefer, it's mg times negative h. But in either scenario, the change and the gravitational potential energy is the final, which is minus mgh, minus the initial, which is zero, and that's negative mgh. And so no matter where I put my datum, my change in potential energy is the same. What's different is what's my potential energy at one point or another. In one point above the ground, it's positive, and the other point below the tower top, it's negative. But the change in potential energy is the same in either case. This scenario is just more sensible. It's easier to use, but neither of them is incorrect when it comes to the mathematics involved. Okay, when we talk about springs, we're going to pretty much stick with springs that obey Hooke's law. And I would remind you that Hooke's law says the force is equal to minus k times the displacement x from the equilibrium position. So x equals zero at equilibrium. All right, so we're going to keep everything in one dimension. In this case, that dimension will be horizontal. So I might have a setup that looks something like this. There's a horizontal spring, and the spring constant is k. And I'll attach a mass to it, so mass m. And we'll make this position x equal to 0. So when the mass is there, the spring is at equilibrium. So if the mass is pulled to the right, the spring is stretched. The mass is now over here. There's x equal to 0. There's the new x value there. When I do that, there's going to be some work having been done. Now what I'm interested in is the work done by the spring. So the work done by the spring, and I'll subscript that with an s. Some books will use an e for elasticity. That's equal to the integral from x1 to x2 of minus kx dotted with dr. Now x is going to be strictly in the i direction and so dr even though it may have two or three dimensions we really don't care all that really matters is the x component. So this would be an integral from x1 to x2 minus kx i hat dotted with dx i hat. Again the j hat doesn't matter because i hat dot j hat is equal to zero. So minus k the integral from x1 to x2 x dx and that's of course equal to minus k x squared over 2 integrating from x1 to x2. Now that's the work done by the spring. So the displacement was to the right and the force is to the left because as I pull this to the right as I pull in this direction the spring is going to be pulling back. So the work done by the spring, not by me pulling on it, but the work done by the spring is to the left. That's why the minus sign here. So the work done by the spring 
is equal to minus one half k x two squared minus x one squared. All right, so potential energy is negative of the work, so the potential energy due to the spring is equal to plus one half k x two squared minus x one squared. But if the initial position is at equilibrium, then I can say, hey, x one is equal to zero. There is no stretch. The at the position x1, the spring is not stretched from equilibrium. And so the potential energy due to the spring is equal to 1 half k times x squared, where x is whatever the distance from the equilibrium position is, that's going to be that x value. And so spring potential energy is 1 half k x squared. I can think of no reasonable examples where you would want the datum the zero value for x to be anything different than the equilibrium.